is Allison, and I am an adult services librarian at the Hudson Library, and I want to thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's demo. Before we get started, I want to remind you to keep checking our website for new virtual programs. We actually have another cooking demo scheduled for June 23rd with Chef Anthony Solero of 111 Bistro in Medina, so be sure to sign up for that. Remember that you can sign up for that program and any others from our website at hudsonlibrary.org. And tonight, I'm happy to introduce Chef Rick Bennett of Sapphire Creek Winery and Gardens in Chagrin Falls. Tonight, he will be sharing several different fish dishes, including braised whitefish tacos and a salmon entree. If you have any questions for Chef Rick during the program, please send them in using the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen, and I can ask him the questions for you. The recipes for tonight were sent in the email with your Zoom link, um, but if you didn't get them for some reason, I will send them out again after the program. So if Chef Rick is ready, we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna be doing some things here that you typically wouldn't see us do in a restaurant. I'm gonna be washing my hands in a bucket so that I don't have to move around a lot. Um, please don't flame me online. I don't care if it is what it is. I'm trying to do a demonstration here. So. <clears throat> understand this is how we cook in restaurants, typically speaking, but at the end of the day, so uh, we're going to start off with our longest cook recipes, which would be the braised fish tacos, obviously, and uh, as well, the butter poached halibut. I'm going to start off by cooking all the fish, so that's, if that's all that you want to see, you can just move along with your day, and then I'm going to move into the actual recipes that I put together for this presentation. So uh, uh, you'll notice that actually most of the ingredients that I bought here, I bought at Heinz. I know that a lot of people who live in Hudson who are probably viewing this, so I chose high ends because I know that there happens to be one right in the center of the town, and that's where uh, people predominantly shop. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm actually going to start off with frozen cod because I know that people can get that pretty regularly. Uh, some of the other fish, the salmon, the halibut, some of these are seasonal. Salmon, obviously, you can get year-round. But uh, the one that I thought most people would like to see is scallops because a lot of people don't know how to cook scallops. And I really predominantly chose this subject matter because it's probably the number one question people ask me or the number one complaint that I hear from people is that they don't know how to cook fish in their house so they go out to eat for fish which i appreciate that but it would also be amazing if you know how to cook fish for yourself so i'm going to start off by grabbing some cod out of my freezer here and a lot of the time when you get frozen fish you're going to want to cook it straight from frozen you're not going to want to thaw it out it just gets super saturated with water like i said heinz cod fillets right out of the heinz freezer I pulled most of this fish out to dry out a little bit, and that's just because, as with all proteins, um, it's better if they dry out a bit just so that you can actually get a proper sear on them. Um, they actually develop what's called pellicles, and it allows them to, um, you know, utilize the heat a little bit better. If you start putting uh, soggy things into a pan, obviously you're not going to get a proper crisp on them, so... So almost at no point in restaurants do we cook on anything below high heat. So you these, these knobs rarely go to the middle. It's always left or top. I'm actually going to start making a Vermont, or actually it's technically a Vermont tank because it's not made with wine, it's made with water. That's going to be our poaching liquid for our halibut. And it's literally just means water mounted with butter. <clears throat> this pan here is going to be the beginning of our uh, tacos. So I'm going to start off with, this is a blended oil. 75% olive and 25% soybean. If you don't like soy oil, that's fine, but you need to find something that isn't just olive oil to cook in because it's not going to get to the heat uh, index that we're looking for. I have a, taken the liberty of prepping a couple things in advance uh, just because I figured that anybody who's thinking about cooking fish is probably already cooked pasta so i don't really need to teach you how to boil water and put noodles in it so you cook your pasta however you want but you know we're going to follow through the procedures as as it were as the recipes speak to so all right i've already got boiling water to get down this done and here i just have some cute butter i'm just going to drop a little bit of heavy cream into the pan this is cheater verblon typically verblons are made in a pan to order but when we need to hold it for a long time in restaurants, we'll add a little bit of heavy cream to stabilize the solution. And at that point, I'm just going to start adding 
a little bit of butter. That's actually one pound of butter in. We can see this pan is starting to reach the smoke point, so I'm going to turn it down a little bit. I'll turn it back up when I need it. And we're going to move over to our cod. So cumin and coriander, both are ground. I'm going to season fairly aggressively. And these are going to toast in the pan a bit. They're not going to want to stick a lot, so we're going to post season the sauce with this as well. But a little bit falls off, I'm not going to have my feelings hurt about it. Salt on everything. And we'll be adjusting the seasoning multiple times. So this pan is still smoking, so I'm not actually going to turn the heat back up just yet. But I am going to tilt the oil away from myself and put the fish to your side down. At which point I'm now going to add some homemade chicken stock that we made here and we've fortified multiple times. So this is actually, we're roasting bones, we're pouring no, more chicken stock over it, we're allowing it to reduce, we're adding, roasting more chicken bones and we do this multiple times to get this solution. And at that point you get a lot of collagen built up, so this is going to reduce and it's going to actually create almost a glaze for this. I've got the oven by my knees built out to 500 degrees already because I assume most people's kitchen uh, kitchen stoves go to that temperature. Mine goes to about 600, 650 because it's a finishing oven. And then I'm just going to take a healthy amount of oregano straight into that liquid. A bit more cumin and coriander. And that pan is going to go straight into the 500 degree oven for a while. Okay. So now our blocks are here, or our vermonte, if you will. And this is all, the only reason I did that was to stabilize the butter so that it can last through a 500 degree oven. So the first piece of halibut that we're going to do is actually just going to be seasoned really aggressively and into the pan. So these are two examples of braising fish, which I don't think a lot of people do, but it's actually a really elegant way to go about the problem. Okay. So next step, I have two kinds of salmon here. They're both skin on right now, so we're gonna take the skin off of one because there's two different processes for seeing skin on fish versus searing uh, skin off fish. So basically, you know, if you want to skin your fish, hold your knife at an angle down towards your board, just shake the skin back and forth, and the knife will do the work for you if you have a nice sharp knife. I assume most people are buying prefabricated fish. I, for somebody who's a fisherman, they already know how to do the fabrication themselves, but there is a massive difference between say round fish and flat fish or monkfish, which has its own designation. But you know, when you get into halibut, it's a completely different fabrication than say salmon. And they start off as round fish and then they turn on their sides and swim that way for the rest of their lives. So while well, I'm just kind of thinking about it, I'm gonna get this asparagus going. And because it's so large, I has only had this monster asparagus. I'm actually going to just poach it um, stem side down in this water here for a bit. Otherwise, it'll be incredibly chewy and fibrous. So, while I have a hot pan still going, we're going to get our salmon working. So, now we have skin on salmon, skin off salmon. And it doesn't make a ton of sense, but for skin on salmon, you're going to want to start on the skin side. Whereas for skin off sear salmon, you're going to want to sear on the flesh side. If you try to sear the where the skin used to be, it's not going to get a, a great end result. I'm just waiting for this pan to get to smoke point. 
very close. You can see the ripples in the foil, actually. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but I can see it here. It just starts actually rippling as though so it wants to jump out of the pan. So I'm going to stack this, and I'm never going to overstack a pan, but two pieces of salmon will pretty easily cook. I could probably get a third one in there, but I four would be pushing it. You never want to have too much stuff going on. Again, I'm going to tilt the oil away from where I'm setting my fish down. And that's when you can see the gray skin from the uh, from the actual skin side. So I'm going to go oil away from myself and flush side down. That's probably good enough for the asparagus because I'm actually going to still sear this. I just wanted to get that fibrous tenant broken down a bit first. I typically would have a more narrow pot and I would only do the stem and not the tips, but this is so large that you can clean the whole thing with no problem. I'll set that aside for myself for a minute. Once you've given it some time, you know, save yourself a little heartache and just pop this in the oven for about four to five minutes. All right. Now, the shrimp dish I'm going to put together all at once. It only takes a couple of seconds. So I'll do, I'll do that last. I'm going to show scallops real quick. So scallops, which I accidentally dusted with cumin, it looks like. You can go a couple different ways with them. And sometimes you'll see at restaurants where they'll actually score the top. And it's really pretty. And it's nice to impress your friends with. We don't often do it at restaurants because it's a little time consuming and has to be done on the spot. But anyways, you'll see the difference between that one and all the others. At this point, I'm just going to season it aggressively like everything else. On both sides. Let me get one more ribbing pan going. <laughs> What we're doing now, we can start talking about this shrimp fish, right? This is going to be some caramelized onions to finish our tacos. Which we're going to start. I'm not going to get carried away caramelizing like the wooden restaurants where it cooks for four hours. These are going to be, you know, at home caramelized. So I'm just going to put them on a pretty high temperature, reduce it, and then toss, toss, toss until they're done. In all cases, I'm not being shy about the oil. It's not because it's just going to absorb it. So most of these recipes, it doesn't really matter if you put a couple extra tablespoons in your pan. Starting to see the shimmer here, but I'm not quite smoking, so I'd like to get just a little closer to the smoke point. That's actually ready to go, so I'm getting away from myself and down. If it doesn't make that sizzle noise, then you probably haven't gotten your pan hot enough to take the fish out and sink it, sink it over. Now you notice almost everything I'm doing is going to be unilateral. I'm cooking on one side only. That's because the fish will cook most of the way through like I like it. Even if I want a medium salmon, I can pull it a little bit early and flip it and let it finish on its other side, but I don't necessarily need to have a sear on both sides to enjoy the fish. Can you tell us one more time what the combination of oil you use is? Sorry? Can you tell us one more time what the combination of oil you use is? So ours is actually 75% olive oil and 25% um, soybean. Awesome, thank you. These scallops are going to finish just like this. I'm not going to an oven. I'm not even worrying about it. I'm just going to forget about them until they tear nicely for me. It's about 75% of the way done if we're going to medium. That took, what, all of three, four minutes, probably. You're 
you're going to see the color start creeping up the side of these scallops. So I'm kind of ignoring the scallops. I'm going to put a little mixture together. I'm barely measuring, but I am going to tell you that you're always going to want to go light on your sesame oil, okay? This is sambal chili paste. I'm going to say roughly about a tablespoon to two tablespoons. This is made for chili sauce, sweet Thai chili sauce. This is going to sweeten this dish up a little bit. I don't want to get carried away. I like my stuff sweet, but not that sweet. I'll put a hint of regular soy sauce. They actually didn't have sweet soy at Highlands today, so I'm using a bit of poison instead. They fill the same niche that like extra little umami sweetness. <clears throat> so at this point, I have a ripping hot pan over here for um, shrimp. Now you can cut these down if you want to. You can leave them intact or take your tails off. These are peeled in the vein. They're ready to go. So I'm actually just going to get them in the pan, let them sear up on their own. And it should be interesting a decent amount of color creeping up on these scallops. This is a fish spatula. If you don't have one in your house, I recommend buying one. You can find it on William Sonoma. You can find them online for about $12. And right now, I'm going to actually finish my cooking with residual heat. I can burn that one a little bit, but it's okay. More color, you get more flavor in these, so it's really not an issue. But the unilateral cooking methodology actually works across the board for just about everything. People online like to joke about burnt scallops, but I've never actually had anybody complain if we overseared a scallop, but if we underseared them, it looks ridiculous. I'm going to lose a little bit of the oil here. Yeah, I'm going to like cooking on residual heat as well. Okay, so I have my sauce for the shrimp dish. The shrimp are already cooked. Now I just need basil, cilantro. I like a little bit of mint and scallion. I'm going to pretty lazily chop these. I'm not even going to get carried away because I don't mind the chunks of stuff in my tacos. I've got my glaze mixture. A little bit of ginger right at the end. I never had my corn early. It tends to sweat out and make it not a little watery. So I'm actually going to cut some corn right now. We have a little bit of trouble hearing you whenever it's close, the camera is close to the pan. Oh, sorry. We'll try to lay back a little bit on that then. Yeah, so the corn should go into the dish last. The herbs should go into the dish last. And you really don't want to have those on a high heat. They'll just burn. From the ginger, same, same idea. You don't want it going for too, too long. These scallops are done. Like, they're actually moving towards well done at this point. So if you wanted a medium, you could probably pull them a little earlier. I'll cut one in half a little bit just to prove the point. And that's pretty much that entire dish. Um, Simply all we have to do now is, I tend to serve mine on either endive leaves or uh, Boston bit lettuce. So it's a pretty fast appetizer if you've got friends over and you just want to get something out to them so they're not starving while you're waiting on dinner.
And it's a really tasty little bite. Again, if you wanted to chop your shrimp up, that makes it a little easier to eat. You know, you can obviously do that too. That, that. And again, Don and I are the only ones eating these, so I'm not concerning myself with things that I would normally concern myself with. Um, all right, so we we'll probably check on a couple things here. At this point, I know our salmon's done. In fact, it's probably pushing all the meat as well. Laterally, all that to do is let it cook on late heat. But here we have a really nice crispy skin on the salmon, and here we have a really nice crispy sear on the flesh side. I'm actually just going to kick those to the back burner. I'm going to do those things. All right, our butter's a little halibut's done. Still in a fairly concentrated butter sauce. I'm going to set that off to the side for later. I think that's probably a good time to stop our questions. Anybody have any questions about the searing or braising fish? There haven't been any that have come in yet. So if anyone has any questions, um, go ahead and use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I have one question that I'm sure some people will ask. Um, do you have any tips for knowing when seafood is done cooking? I feel like that's a common problem when cooking seafood. It's different than, you know, like chicken where you can tell that it's not pink anymore. Do you have any tips for that? Honestly, you can touch the size. The one, when you know that, all right, a perfect example of salmon being in a range of medium to medium well is when I touch the size, it's not squishy anymore. So it's almost like a, a filet steak in that regard. Um, you kind of get a, a feel for it. You know, salmon actually only takes about five to seven minutes to get to medium. Um, and you push beyond that, you're going to medium well. And by the time you get to medium well, you're almost well done already. Like if you're a minute between medium well and well done. So you have to be quick to pull it off. And if I don't take these off of here right now, they're going to continue cooking and they're going to go well beyond where I want them. So, I mean, like I said, you just kind of have to get an internal timer. But the one thing I know is that these aren't well done. And I know that because there's not white, um, white albumin leaching out of the sides. Once you get to the point where the white stuff's leaching out the sides, you pass beyond well done. Um, it's actually the proteins leaching out of the salmon. It's kind of, you know, if you like your salmon well done, it's not a big deal. But me personally, I would prefer mine in the medium range. So like I said, you know, get yourself, you know, about five minutes in the oven, pull it out, flip it, let it go for maybe two more, three more. Awesome. Okay. I have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, this one was just wondering, how do you know what type of frying pans can go in the oven? Okay. So a couple things I should have probably discussed from the get. Um, this is not an operation for non-stick pans. So pretty much never. Um, especially if something has a rubber handle, you're not going to want to go in the oven with it. I would recommend that if you're not using either stainless or aluminum, or I think probably cast iron would be probably my last pick, then you probably shouldn't be going in your oven with it. Okay. And then someone asked, do you have a fish vendor that you prefer in the area that also sells to the public? So actually, funny story, uh, Euro USA sells to Heinz, Gatanese sells to Heinz. So all the reps that I use for my restaurant sell to your grocery store. Perfect. All right, I think you can keep going. That's all the questions for now. All right, perfect. So now we're kind of on to other things. So our caramelized onions, I'm probably going to let those go a little bit longer, but they're getting about where I want them for my tacos. What I'm actually going to do is make my fish out and add them to that braising liquid, which is starting to reduce pretty aggressively. I'm going to take a second and spoon some of my liquid over the top of that fish. And it'll, it'll start glazing as it reduces because, again, we have all the collagen from the chicken stock. I'm just going to get the onions in there and let them marry up. And they'll continue cooking because I'm putting them on top where they can continue uh, braising the oven. All right, don't forget about that, dude. 
just for a while we do some other things. So the one thing I did do is I made the pea puree previous to this just because um, it's a pea puree. I mean, you seriously take, we have a saying in restaurants, you wait until peas are in season, then use frozen peas. And the reason is because garden peas are great when you eat them out of your garden, kind of fresh with a pinch of salt on them. They're kind of a, a mess to deal with. And frozen peas come out of the ground, they get harvested, they get blanched on the spot, and they get blasted for blast chilled. So this is as good as eating a pea straight out of the garden, in my opinion. And they, they, they tend to cook really well and easily. So um, anyways, this is about the, it's almost like a soup by the time you're done. Uh, and you're literally taking cold frozen peas in with cold water in a, a blender or a, a bite of prep if you have one. Add salt, add a clove of garlic, and you get that. <coughs> so, and most people tell me that it's, it tastes like peas fresh out of the garden, which is right, it does, because they came just fresh out of the ground, straight to blast chill. Frozen corn and frozen peas are probably two of my favorite frozen products. All right, so we still need to get our last halibut seared up for halibut two ways. It's the same process that we just went through with the salmon um, or anything seared. They're all kind of on the same page. Um, again, if, you know, if somebody wants to see fabrication at some other time, you know, maybe we can discuss a different class about that, but that's not what we're doing right, right now today. All right, so I'm going to clean up some broccolini for myself. I'm going to clean up some asparagus for myself, which we already blanched. And then I'm going to um, just chop these stems down so they cook a little nicer. Well, it's heavy seasoning there. Deal with that in a moment. I'm going to need a little bit more corn for a corn curry that I'm about to make. Awesome. Now, I would typically save my corn. Um, stocks and run them as a stock, I would actually turn it into a, a corn stock and use it for something, maybe a muscle dish in the summertime, or, you know, even just to pick up other dishes so they're a little more flavorful. We don't do so much, do it so much in restaurants, but just for you know, kind of going along with the trend of the, the day and age, uh, it seems that a lot of people are trying to eat healthier. They don't want to cut up butter in their food. Um, maybe less oils, but less saturated fats in general. So this one I don't want to start on high heat, just because I don't want this corn to color. I want this to be a vibrant yellow. So in this case, I'm going to use just corn. Uh, a little bit of heavy cream, and browse out the noodles, which is, simply translates to uh, top shelf spices, or at least that's my understanding of the definition, or the translation as it were. So, I'm going to go pretty moderately aggressive, I'm going to say that's, that's about a tablespoon of browse out the noodles, and I may add more to adjust seasoning later. 
ham and season it with salt and pepper like we always do. I'm just going to let the rise out the dish toast a little bit so that it takes on more flavor. It doesn't need to toast forever. I just want to get, I got, it's already really fragrant right now. I'm just going to let it go for a minute or two without getting color on the corn again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really leaned on nice spring summer uh, dishes for this particular uh, demonstration. So obviously, we're going into those months, and again, I just don't want to eat heavy food when this time of year comes. I'm, I'm mostly leaning on salads, but if I have people over, I still want to make something relatively elegant for them to enjoy. <laughs> Cream to sit for too long in here, so I'm actually going to yank it and I'm going to go straight to the puree on this. You also don't want to get carried away with the amount of heavy cream you put in because it's supposed to be a sauce, not a. Uh, it'll, it'll turn to water essentially. You won't be able to taste any either the corn or the raza on the noodle. All right. And I'm not even going to straighten this. This is ready to go. Normally, we would have a chinois or a fine mesh sieve, but you can see that's fairly fluid, and I'm fine with that. Could you repeat what the seasoning was that you put in there? Yeah, it's actually called Raz Al Hanou. It's actually, let's see if I can find the container. It's just a blend of golden curry spices. You can see it's a little darker than the golden curry you would get at, say, Giant Eagle. Awesome. Thank you. Pleasure. All right, so our corn curry puree is ready to go. That dish is going to finish with um, seared cauliflower steak. I'm sure everybody's been on the cauliflower hype train, so this has been going on for about eight, nine years now. But it is a, a fantastic vegetable. I'm trying to do a ton of this because I'm only making one dish, but... The cauliflower is going to provide height. The asparagus is going to provide height. And we do try to build dishes with elevation so that it just looks nicer on the plate. Okay. I'm actually going to cook the cauliflower and the asparagus in the same pan. So at this point, you've, you have now used what? You've got the pan for the salmon we've got the pan for the corn curry sauce and one pan for all vegetables that's a three pan pickup and of course if you made your corn curry sauce in advance you just have a little stock pot going on the back burner so one less thing to worry about when your friends come over for dinner and of course in our case our salmon's already cooked which i would never do for a party ever or at the restaurant for that matter I want to get a heavy caramelization on my cauliflower. I personally, I like my cauliflower nearly burnt. I've got a couple questions here if you want to answer them while that cooks up. All right, so since we have our scalp done. Questions. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Do you want to answer Wait. questions or do you want to keep going? No, it's okay. Go right ahead. Okay, so someone um, asked, I like to crisp, crisp up salmon skin separately. Have, have you ever done that? Absolutely. So typically what we'll do if we want to do that in a restaurant is we'll actually uh, – Kind of funny, but I'll take the salmon off. I'll invert one pan. I'll put a, a decent amount of oil on that pan, and then I'll put the salmon skin down. You can see we can probably do three, four pieces of salmon skin. 
and this pan goes down after it's already been heated on this burner. Does that make any sense? All right, we had one more here waiting. Um, this person says, you mentioned not thawing the fish first before cooking. This seems like it would make the fish mushy. I'm not experienced at cooking fish. No, it's actually quite the opposite. It becomes super waterlogged when you take it out and thaw it first. In fact, if you read the instructions on a lot of frozen fish, it'll stay flat out, um, cooked straight from frozen. Especially in the case, I know they have a product at Heinen's, which is uh, bay scallops. They are delightful. They're a good frozen product, but you have to go straight from frozen. Otherwise, you will destroy the, the scallops. So this, this disintegrates the pan. Thanks. That's a great tip. We can see our cauliflower looking good. Our asparagus from earlier. We get a little salt and pepper on both. You can see the amount of color. I'm still going to hit the oven. Our halibut's out now. And you can see it's cooked, so pretty much flawlessly cooked, actually. It's a little bit translucent in the center, but nothing, you know, I like my uh, halibut in the range of medium to medium well. I don't like it all the way well done. So I'm actually not going to let it sit in this pan anymore. I'm going to straighten the plate there. That's a beautiful sear. I'd be excited if that showed up at my table. Guys, is there anything else left to cook? Oh, yeah, we still have to make pasta. That's about it. All right, so the halibuts, both are ready. I'm going to play with that in a minute. But I believe we're working on salmon with curry sauce, yeah. All right, fried capers. Honestly, fried capers are simple. You could do them in your air fryer. It's not a difficult process at all. But at this point, I believe once that is very ready, we can go to the plate. We have scallops are ready to go. I think I'm going to go out of bowl with those. I just kind of feel like that's the right move. All right, so scallops, we have that pea puree, which is less a recipe and more a process. You, you might have to go back and forth. Maybe it needs a little more peas to thicken it up. Maybe it needs a little less. But the one thing I can tell you is you don't want a lot of heat on it. You can go high heat, but you can only go for a minute. You don't want it boiling. If it starts boiling, it's going to turn army, army uh, or what they call it, OD, OD green, olive drab. And nobody wants that on their plates. It's got so while we're on the subject, we actually work at a winery. So Don, why don't you tell them the wine that we chose for the shrimp dish that we just put together and why we chose it. So what I have here is our Sauvignon Blanc. And the reason... Bottle for you. Our Sauvignon Blanc. And the reason why we chose that is because it marries well with the shrimp and the heat in the dish with the citrus forward nature of the Sauvignon Blanc. So it doesn't overpower the dish and the dish doesn't overpower it. It's a perfect pairing. Okay, we have PPA. We have nicely seared scallops. And we're just finished that. So I took um, minus eight vinegar and a little bit of sugar for this, uh, just to macerate them because they're not, they're in season, but they're not in season in Ohio, really. I mean, I don't know if you have strawberries coming up, but I don't yet. And uh, so just a little bit of sugar or uh, of vinegar to add a little bit of something uh, goes a long way. And I finished that with a couple of dollars of uh, goat cheese. And basically, typically I would acidulate, you know, maybe 50-50 lemon juice and olive oil with a pinch of salt. And I dress almost all of my salads with that. It's just super simple. Gives a little bit of a citrus hint. So I would just dress a little bit of arugula salad, pop it off to the side like that. And you have a pretty, you know, kind of a delicious looking dish, I think. What do you think, Don? It looks good. 
looks amazing. I can't wait to eat it. That's too down, right? Yes. Okay. Like I keep saying, color ethos flavor, actually Michael Simon taught me that years ago. I previous to that I didn't foil everything, but I just didn't understand it. You know, kind of getting that caramelization on things really takes it to the next level. So I'm actually gonna pour asparagus aside. I'm kind of a freak show, so I like my asparagus facing the same way or it doesn't taste as good. <laughs> and I'm just gonna get this built for a little height, something for these salmon to lean on. Pick your salmon of choice. Again, I like skin side up. Give them a little lean. I would typically play with spoons, but I'm going to pour it straight from this guy. And then I have a decent little amount of color from my asparagus. So that's, that's that dish. We have a comment that says, your plating skills are amazing. How can we improve our plating skills? Any resources to check out? I don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I just worked in restaurants for a long time. I, I go out to eat a lot, and I try to observe what other people are doing and see, okay, does this work for me? Does this not work for me? Can I improve upon this? The one thing that you'll see with a lot of the fine dining restaurants or even even fast casuals that really understand what's going on is we're trying to build up always a little bit of height. It doesn't have to be. You can, you know, a sashimi dish. I don't want to pile this tall personally, but that's sashimi. It's a different ball game. Um, so we do try to build high. I try to, obviously, these are all spring and summer vegetables. And I, I really try to cook seasonally as much as possible. But I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm sorry. I wish I did. <laughs> No, that's good. So we need to take pictures of our food when we go out to eat and use that as inspiration. <laughs> yeah, as inspiration, exactly. But, you know, not repetition necessarily. But if you do love the dish, steal it. I mean, <laughs> I, I think I've heard the saying at one point that uh, good artists create and great artists steal. I'm pretty sure that's how that goes. So we got three down. What am I missing? Oh, we have halibut to do with, yeah. Mm. Oh, and tacos, of course. Tacos. I'm a big fan of corn tortillas, and our taco dish is literally ready to go. I need some herbs, um, I need a lime wedge, and I'm just plating tacos. We've all done this, right? So, I mean, how could that be bad? The glaze is reduced almost to the point where it's non-existent, but it's all over the fish, and the fish is just falling apart, which is exactly what I was hoping for. This isn't going to be a multi-texture dish. It's going to be pretty uh, you know, one note as far as textures go, but I'm okay with that. But the one thing about corn tortillas is that there's a tortilla that has to be cooked. If you like flour tortillas, I bet this would be amazing with flour, too. It's okay. You have to excuse me. I didn't feel like turning my flat griddle on today because it's already pretty hot in here. And I'm actually going to step off camera to grab a lime real quick. I'm a liar. We ran out of limes because it was a really busy weekend. So that's a, uh, you can imagine what the lime would have looked like on the taco. And these don't have to be cooked forever. You just want to get a tiny bit of color on each side. If you like your grill, grill them. It's awesome that way too. And this is a really, really straightforward, simple. It's like I said, it's the fish equivalent of carnitas, um, which I think probably most people have had at some point. But the, the most important part is that you get the crisp and the glaze on the fish. A lot of people double up their taco shells. I don't discourage that because it is a sloppy mess of a dish. I mean, the fish is, fish is incredibly flaky. It's got a sear on the one side. 
smell my organ, uh, oregano stems in there. It smells amazing. It does. All right, so again, a little, little squeeze of lime. I've got some cilantro in here. I'm just going to fresh pick. And this is what I eat at my house by myself, like in shame. So that's four now, right? All right, last one should just take a second because I already cooked off the noodles like I said I did. I didn't want to be a liar, so those are right there. But this process is actually really interesting, and I learned it from a, a Chinese roommate that I had in Baltimore some 15 years ago, I think. So, really a decent lot of scallops, or scallions, as it were. I have already garlic cut up um, that I chopped previous to the video, because I assume everybody has decent knife skills at this point. We're not going to use the whites of the scallions at all. We just want the green part. We can save that to grill later or something. So our fish is already cooked, so that's done. The only thing we really need to do is I need to heat up oil. And I need to make the mixture for my noodles. Now this, this is actually a pretty specific recipe. I don't recommend straying incredibly far from it. The one thing that I always tend to ramp up is I like toasted sesame oil in mine. Ling Chang did not. Um, I like to use sriracha and sambal typically um, because I like a little bit more heat. And you can see I'm not measuring this super accurately, but I know about what two tablespoons looks like, so I feel pretty comfortable in my measurements here. But I like to go for like four tablespoons, if we're being honest. I just like heat. At that point, you need just a touch of soy, touch of sugar. And I found some brown rice vinegar at Heinen's, which is incredibly uh, lucky because they typically don't have it. Did I miss anything on that recipe? Let's see. Salt. I'm going to need a pinch of sugar, so I'm going to go grab that. I'll be right back. So this makes a full pound of pasta, and it's absolutely worth it because I, I, I lived on this for like a year and a half. Um, Ling and I would just make an entire full pound at a time, and we needed it until it was gone. And I mean, it was an almost every day of meal. You can do anything with it. You can throw fish on it, chicken on it, whatever you want, and it's just kind of universal. So he liked to cool down his noodles. I typically actually throw my noodles into this sauce hot um, because I feel like it just saturates a little bit more. We really just need to go in. And the real trick to this is to make it the day before you want it and just let it sit in the cooler with plastic wrap over top. It's incredibly light. It's moderately healthy. It's about as healthy as pasta can get. And it just gets better with age. And so the trick to this is then, right at the end, it's going to make a pocket of scallions. And a nest in the center with garlic. I'm not shy about either of those things. I actually don't follow the recipe at all for the uh, scallions and garlic. I just like a lot. And you can see my oil is superheated. And we're just going to go straight over to get this aromatic. And that's actually the true trick to the dish right there. Last thing I have to do for this dish is just to get some broccolini sorted out. And this is another one. I don't get really ridiculous with the recipe on it. The one thing you need has is an incredibly hot pan, which as you can see, this one's ready to catch on fire. I'm just going to kill the heat. Stem in first. I chop those up. They won't cook at the same time as the, uh, as the crown. This is the same kind of thing. Pitch of sesame oil, get a lot of color. 
that they call it. I lie, lie on a soy sauce. Got this miso at uh, Heinz as well. Light sweet miso. This is a white miso, so it's a little more mild. I'm going to put that right on top of this fish here. That's my butter poach. I'm going to go back in the oven with it. Just a touch of heat on this one. We don't want to get carried away. Because we're already eating the uh, noodles. That's ready to go. I like my vegetables crunchy when it comes to this, especially Asian food, but kind of in general. Can we make bowl? Yes, bowl for bowl. sure. Uh, bowl for new. I'm actually excited because I haven't made these in a while, so I'm really stoked to eat these. <laughs> this is fucking honest. Nice. Can you share your secret to getting the no stick pasta before you mixed it in sauce? So actually, um, basically I'll just throw a little bit of oil on it once it comes out of the water. We don't, we don't shock pasta. It's disgusting. Like, uh, we don't run it under water is what I mean to say. So, um, we like to leave the starch attached, but if just a, a dash of oil will keep it from sticking, it's really simple. Just make sure you toss it well. But that's been sitting for probably an hour and a half, I would imagine. A little bit of that. And take your poison. You can either do your hoisin glaze. Or your butter braise. Look at it. Can't be mad about that. So... Don, why don't you go ahead and talk about the other wine pairings that we came up with for them. I'm just going to pull one dish down at a time and we'll talk a little bit and then uh, let everybody get home and get on their way after maybe a couple questions. Drinks. We're good on questions so far, so go ahead with your wine pairings. Okay. Oh. This is Maria talked about so. shrimp, so. Yeah, I think we're good to go. Ignore my mess. I was trying to in a hurry there. <laughs> so with the fish tacos, we've gone with our Sapphire Creek Chenin Blanc. But the reason is because with the little bit of cumin and that spice in the taco, the Chenin Blanc is incredibly mild. It's not dry. It's not a dry white wine. So it's not going to fight with the spice we put into our fish. So it is going to pair together really nicely and be really mellow on the palate. Thank you. You like some? I might as well. <laughs> and then with the scallops, with the fresh pea or frozen pea puree and the strawberries, we've chosen a rose. Uh, our rose in particular has notes of fresh strawberry, it's very fruit forward. So it'll marry nicely with the dish as well. I'll drink all these later. It's okay. You can just <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. We're breaking the rules a little bit with the salmon, or the halibut, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the halibut with the soy sauce and the brown vinegar. We're going to go with a fruit-forward Pinot Noir, because contrary to popular belief, you do not have to pair white wine with fish. Uh, a delicate red will do the trick for you as well. And then lastly, we've gone with our... Sparkling cuvee, which is semi-dry, semi-sweet, bubbly. This is going to go really, really nicely, again, with the cumin spices that we used on our, and with our curry corn puree on our salmon. So it's not going to fight against any of the flavors on the dish. It'll be really mellow, and it kind of sweetens it up a bit. Beautiful. That's it. That's all I've got for you. Do we make on an hour? <laughs> yeah, you're right yes. on time. Um, oh, we nailed it. Perfect. <laughs> We were um, wondering, someone said, are any of these recipes currently on the menu? Actually, no. Some of these are my past recipes. That's just something I like to eat at my house. Same with that <laughs> one. 
that I could use for a spring menu, no problem. I could put that on tomorrow, and I guarantee we would sell 50, 60 a night, no doubt. But, uh, you know, this one used to be one of my staples. I, I try to never repeat recipes twice, so. And also, I'm not trying to give out all my secrets just yet, right? <laughs> Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, before we go, can you tell us um, where people can come um, visit you guys and where they can buy the wines? Okay, so yeah, uh, as, of, as of right now, we only have the one location. We're at uh, 16965 Park Circle Drive in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Uh, currently, they can only buy the wines here. Uh, we have a proprietary blend that a vintner in Napa makes for us. Um, we actually go out once a year and just taste test and make sure it's the wines we want to use. And we are talking about future venues, so do keep in touch. Uh, if you wanted to see a virtual walkthrough or a venue, please feel free to visit Sapphire Creek. It's the first thing that'll pop up when you type it in. And uh, we actually have a full video walkthrough. Uh, and the grounds are amazing. A landscaping company actually owns the restaurant, so it's pretty insane out here. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chef Rick. And thank you to Dawn for the information about the wine pairings. Um, I will, again, send the recipes out after this program. Um, if you're registered, I'll send it to your email address. And I'll also send a link to the Sapphire Creek Winery and Gardens website so you can check them out and be sure to support. And so thanks again, Chef Rick. Have a good night, everyone.